I was asked for a little bit of sort of autobiographical grounding for why I'm here and doing what I'm doing these days. It was an insatiable and undisciplined, interdisciplinary, wide-ranging appetite for knowledge from a scientifically oriented family, but uh, I was interested in all variety of problems. It led me to get a PhD in the field of geography, uh, focusing on how technological innovations diffuse through society. And the technological innovations I found most interesting were those that were good for the planet. So in particular, I have a focus on clean energy. And that took me to um, writing a number of papers that brought together either five in some cases or 11 national laboratories. I led the five lab report that was published in 1997 that was under an underpinning of uh, President Clinton's a signing of the Kyoto Protocol that you might remember. In um, 1997, he signed. The Senate did not ratify, but uh, he acknowledged that we could decrease our CO2 emissions nationwide by the year uh, 2010 um, by 5%. And um, while that wasn't um, uh, wasn't approved by the Senate. It did lead incrementally to, in 2015, we did sign the Paris Accord, right? So, you know, we should celebrate that we do have some uh, substantial commitments being made at the federal level, but I'm going to turn to what's happening at the local levels. So first, for a little bit of context, on the left side, the science, you know, you know about this why we need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions across the globe. On the right side is the response. So today we have about 22% of emissions uh, in countries and populations that have a carbon tax, where there is an economic penalty or cost associated with those emissions. So there's some motivation. About 20% of the world's largest corporations have announced net zero targets, typically for the year 2050. 25 US states have committed to meeting Paris, uh, the Paris goals. And 22 US states have plans for how they'll do that. Now, I'm going to talk about the state where I've been living for 15 years, the state of Georgia, which has none of that. No price, no goal, no plan. <laughs> and a number of universities in that state got together with funding from several philanthropic organizations, but in particular the Ray C. Anderson Foundation, and decided to start a grassroots effort to look at the science and to see what would be most promising as a roadmap that the state of Georgia could follow to most uh, expeditiously and effectively and inexpensively meet significant carbon reductions. So we started uh, with the Project Drawdown Report's 100 Global uh, Climate Solutions. This is a report, I hope you've all seen it, by Paul Hawken. We could have chosen to start with the IPCC lists of options, but I really liked Paul Hawken's approach because he had solutions like, let's educate women. <laughs> it was a global report, you know. So some things didn't translate as well to the US, but I liked the breadth of his uh, list. And then the question we had was, which of those 100 could meet the needs of the state of Georgia? And it, while we're at it, let's try to itemize the process of down selecting so that someone somewhere else might be able to replicate what we've done. And I worked with, uh, of course, my colleagues across campus at Georgia Tech, uh, at the University of Georgia in particular for the ag and uh, forest solutions, at Emory University for health consequences, and at, uh, and forgot to mention, Georgia State came along later on uh, also to look at the economics. So we started by putting the 100 global solutions through a set of uh, sieves, questions. Is, it, are, is a solution relevant to Georgia? Is it ready? 
Is it going to have a big enough impact to be worth our while? Is it cost effective? And does it have any non-carbon consequences, good or bad, that might propel it in or remove it from our short list? So that was our down selection process. Um, and it resulted in a roadmap of 20 high impact climate solutions for the state of Georgia. And it's interesting, if you think about wherever you're from, what would be on that list. And it wouldn't be the same. The point is that everyone needs a roadmap. You need a roadmap for your community, for your neighborhood, your state, for the region in which you live. And we don't have that now. But we do have a process you could use to get there. Uh, the roadmap of 20 impact, high impact solutions cover the major sectors of the economy, from electricity to transportation. Of course, those are the two biggest sectors for the state of Georgia and the US today. Uh, buildings and food and ag and materials and land sinks. Um, we, for each one of those 20 solutions, had a team. And that team asked the question, what's the technical potential of that solution? What would be the maximum? So there's sort of a physical principles question. You know, if you put a solar rooftop, a solar panel on every rooftop, how much electricity would it generate and what would it displace to get an estimate of how much CO2 it could be responsible for um, avoiding? Um, so having bounded the, the current baseline and the technical potential, we could then talk about, well, what would be achievable as a, something in between? Aspirational, more than the direction we're going in, a ra more rapid pace of uptake of those solutions than is currently happening, uh, but one which is you know, a reasonable. So a reasonable, for instance, for electric vehicles that we might, by the year 2030, um, have them make up 15% of new sales in the state of Georgia. Right now, they make up 4%. Or um, growing large-scale solar from the 2% of the electric mix in Georgia that it currently is to 11%. That was actually done by some sophisticated uh, modeling using the National Energy Modeling System, NIMS, which is shown there. Um, now, having evaluated each of the 20 solutions, we then had to step back and say, well, how would this work in a systems approach? Because you're not going to be adopting one and not any of the others. You're going to be adopting, hopefully, all of them, of course. And how would they work uh, as a system? There's some obvious competitive, competitive effects. For instance, you might be competing for the same inputs, like land, right? You want a forestation, you want afforestation and you want solar farms. So you got to work that out. Or there's some competition, too. You might want uh, to decarbonize electricity, but that means that all the focus on energy efficiency doesn't get you as much. You may want to focus on electric vehicles, but if you don't have a clean electric system, then that's no better than what we have today. So all of those meant that we had to go into a significant modeling a phase which uh, is all well documented in a number of, of publications, including one last year, which made it into the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, now, the way that results in um, carbon studies are often portrayed is by using a wedge diagram. So you start with the current state of emissions that's 180 or so million tons for the state of Georgia per year. And then you remove from that what you can assign to the sequestration from forests, soils, and coastal wetlands. And then you have a baseline from which you then uh, reduce further CO2 from that baseline from your, each of the five sectors, transportation, electricity, buildings, et cetera. And what we found with our achievable levels of solution adoption, you could go from the 156 million ton footprint that Georgia had in the year 2005 to a footprint of 79 million tons in the year 2030 
which happens to be just shy of meeting the climate accord, which is 50% reduction in 2030 relative to the baseline of 2005. That didn't drive us. That wasn't our driver, but we've shown how it can occur. And um, we go from there then to characterizing what it would cost. I mean, that's part of how you estimate what's achievable, but now you button it up as a system and ask, summing all of the cumulative private costs and all of the cumulative private benefits, how do they compare? Now, the range is rather wide. It goes from a range of 140 million of costs, might be the ticket, or maybe 12 billion in benefits, right? But you can see everything from the, on the left side of this graph pay for themselves, and everything on the right side uh, costs you something. So electric vehicles cost you something. If you go and buy one today, you know there's a premium. Now that's in part because we're not valuing the health and environmental and other benefits of having fewer um, tons of CO2 emitted, right, and other pollutants, but still, it's not such a big cost. So all together, we span a range of costs that are mostly favorable. And so, again, leaving us with this idea of sort of a double dividend. We can help the environment and we can benefit the economy. So um, success, uh, now we're sort of moving into the action stage, but there's still a lot of research that has to be done to support this action and momentum. One is to engage with business. So we have established a business compact with 25 members. It just was launched in January of this year. And each of those compact uh, members, you know these by name, many of them, but some not, because they do include some very small uh, entrepreneurial uh, firms in, in the state of Georgia. Um, and uh, they are working as um, affiliates or together in affinity groups. They have issues, like they want to figure out where can they buy carbon credits from? <laughs> How can they promote electric vehicle use by their, uh, by their um, staff? We're every, in order to become a compact member, you have to agree to certain terms, like making available the data you have on your emissions. And also, you need to account for what you're doing in scopes one, two, and three emissions, which means what you're doing as a business and manufacturing your products, what you're buying and your suppliers are doing, and also what your um, staff and your employees are doing, how they get to work, how they vacation, how they live. All of that bundled up, they need to begin to talk about. Um, <clears throat> we're also um, working on persuasion. Actually, I changed this from the morning talk. <laughs> um, so we're providing what we call, we call this beneficial competition, right? Information about as localized level as possible, the emissions occurring across the state of Georgia. There are 159 counties in Georgia, more than any other state. So we chose the county level. It's easy to report on a monthly basis. How's everyone doing across uh, residential, commercial, industrial, transportation, industry, um, and, and what are the trends? So get that persuasion going. And we're also now turning to where are the solutions? So for instance, where do we have electric vehicles? And where do we have charging stations? And you'll see in the last uh, slide or two talk, talking about equity. You know, where do we need to put public dollars in order to enable everyone to be part of the solution? You see when you look at charging stations that they are in urban areas, not rural areas, unless they're on the highway. And when they're in urban areas, they're not everywhere. They're in the affluent areas. So uh, we've got a lot to deal with there. Uh, we have assessed uh, the equity elements of our 20 solutions, but I think that I'm going to leave you with this last uh, slide here. But our process was not sufficiently inclusive. 
and we are remedying that by broadening our team. We now have three HBCUs signed up to be part of uh, our planning going forward. Our advisory team, our uh, team that's going to evaluate next phases of of a research to support this are going to be much more inclusive. And if you want to hear more, here's the team and lots of websites to turn to. I look forward to your questions. Thank you.